Hello, everybody. This is uh, Aaron Doughton with Sencor. Uh, thanks for the introduction there, Livian. Um, as she said, uh, I've been, a, been at Sencor for about 10 years and actually going closer, I think, five years for being in product management. Um, yeah, so uh, through my experiences with some of the new product development over the last couple of years, um, I put together this topic to talk to you guys about today, um, being reliable internet transport. Um, I don't want to talk about it necessarily in terms of it being a brand new technology or anything like that, but it is definitely a trend in the industry that is growing extremely quickly, um, especially over the last, uh, I would say, year and a half to two years, um, you know, doing video transport over the internet is, uh, is definitely becoming commonplace. Um, you know, a lot of times, or I guess previously, um, it was considered maybe a backup path to maybe satellite or uh, fiber-based connections, but uh, in today's age, we're starting to see this as, as even a primary uh, method of transport. So I, what I wanted to do was uh, talk through uh, a couple points um, throughout the presentation. Um, so the agenda looks like this. We'll be uh, kind of asking ourselves some questions uh, like why use the internet for video transport? Um, you know, how can we use the internet for video transport? So talk about the protocols, kind of the problems with, uh, or I guess, the, the challenges of, of transporting video over the internet. And once we understand that, um, I want to talk about the differences and how those systems are set up. Um, they can actually be either point to point um, or, or in cloud based architecture. And I want to describe what the differences are, and what that looks like to to customers and end users and things like that, and, and give you some kind of. Uh, you know, maybe some insight on, on what we've seen from Sencor's perspective and what that looks like. Um, and then I want to talk about how Sencor can help with the solution. Um, I'm, I will do a little bit of a product plug, but uh, in addition to that, I actually want to highlight some really unique applications that we've um, sold our products into that I think will give a really neat or interesting insight about, um, you know, how people are utilizing these technologies and, and the internet for video transport um, and, and a lot of different systems that um, you wouldn't normally see in traditional broadcasts. So I want to talk about that a little bit. The final Q and A. Um, as Livian said, um, if you guys have any questions, kind of as I go through each individual section, um, feel free to bring it up in the chat window. I have it up here in front of me, so I should be able to react pretty quickly. Um, and then, of course, at the end of each section, I will pause shortly. If you guys want to, um, you know, unmute, ask me some live questions, we can uh, have a little bit of a Q and A there. And then, like I said, I'll wrap it up with a final Q and A at the end. So, anyway, without further ado, we will uh, start off with our first question: Why use internet for video transport? You know, it really isn't any good for. Uh, it's good for you know Facebook and and, and YouTube and, and email and that's about it, right? That's that's the only thing good. The internet's good for. Well, not quite. Um, we're actually able to use the internet for video transport now. But um, I wanted to talk about why people are trans transitioning um, to video uh, transport over the internet and and kind of the reasons why we're getting there. And really, uh, the problem with tra uh, traditional transport. Um, you know, primarily talking about satellite and fiber type transport for video um, is that it's expensive. I think everybody knows this. Um, I think the writing's on the wall, um, both from a CapEx perspective and an operating, uh, you know, operating expense. Uh, it can be expensive both ways, whether or not you've uh, built your own system or built your own infrastructure. Um, there's, there's a lot of people all over the world that have their own satellites that they rent out to, to other vendors and things like that. But a lot of people are renting satellite space, um, so that can be very expensive. And fiber can be just as expensive as satellite time. So each of them have their uh, pros and cons. But obviously, uh, you know, spending money on them is is definitely one of the things that people want to get away from. How can I do things more cheaply? Um, the other thing is the systems can be uh, quite complicated. Um, what we're kind of talking about there is. Uh, Specialized equipment to uh, use the technology. So, for satellite, for instance, um, obviously you have all different kinds of, you know, modulators and satellite dishes and LMBs and the control systems for those satellite dishes and LMBs, uh, encryption systems. Since we're, you know, transporting signals, uh, you know, through the air, people can be you know, pick those up from uh, sometimes any satellite dish and be able to, you know, capture that video, which you might not want them to be able to do that. Um, and of course, doing things over fiber can sometimes have their uh, own security issues as well. Um, so there's a lot of specialized equipment in order to, uh, you know, make that usable. 
One of the other things is uh, long deployment cycles. Um, so I think anybody that's in the industry has, has probably worked on a multi vendor RFP, you know, the multi page checkbox, you know, do you support this? Do you support that um, kind of papers and going through the whole process of selecting vendors and working with integrators and, you know, um, getting more competitive pricing and just that whole process eats up a lot of cycles to actually get a system deployed um, and usable. And then, of course, uh, you know, working with integrators, integrators to do the install and test and, and testing the equipment and making sure all of the pieces of equipment that you've selected um, to build out a system, um, especially a brand new system, takes a very long time to make sure all those things are compatible with each other. So it, it's just really long deployment cycles. And, and what I mean by long, I guess, to give you a real time frame there, I would say, I, I mean, even at the, at the quickest broadcast system deployment, um, that's using satellite or fiber. I, I would say it's probably a, a four to six month at the very least uh, d deployment cycle in order to get those things up and off the ground. Um, and even if you did them, if you wanted to do it faster, it would probably cost you more money. Um, or if you wanted to do it faster, maybe you didn't do the uh, compatibility testing, and then you have issues during your very first, uh, you know, signals and, and video transport projects and stuff in that system. So, you know, that's kind of the those are the problems that traditional transport has had, um, well, I think for forever. Um, but I think people are starting to realize that there are technologies out there that can be leveraged um, in order to kind of overcome these uh, these issues. Um, kind of diving more into uh, just the costs and challenges of doing uh, satellite uh, video transport. Um, like I was saying before, it's expensive. Um, doing um, you know, 1 megahertz uh, per month is about $2,000 US in OPEX expenditures. That's just assuming that you're renting the space. And so that's a constant year round, uh, you know, expenditure that costs you up to 24 K US uh, in a year, which is, which is significant. And that's only 1 megahertz worth. So what if you want, what if you need more? Um, or what if you need to go to, you know, multiple satellites to cover multiple parts of the globe? Um, those are all things we'll have to consider. And doing uh, video transport over satellite. Uh, I kind of already covered this a little bit, but uh, the specialized equipment um, that you need for all of these types of systems, uh, you know, the modulators, the dishes, the receivers, the, the, the encryption systems, and actually some of the encryption, encryption systems um, have uh, support contracts and SLA agreements and all of that kind of stuff that go along with that. So again, more money. Um, and then, of course, satellite has the uh, uh, funny problem of actually being uh, susceptible to stuff like, uh, you know, atmospheric conditions, certain times of the year, sunspots can actually be really bad, um, and weather causes uh, signal degradation. So if you have, like, a really bad storm or something like that, and you're trying to do, I don't know, live coverage of, uh, for instance, like a hurricane or a typhoon or something like that, and, and somebody's trying to get a signal out of that particular area, satellite may or may not be the best thing for you. Um, depending on what the atmospheric conditions can be. I mean, it's already dangerous enough to put somebody on the ground, um, but let alone if they're on the ground and they can't get the signal back to your remote studio. Well, that's uh, kind of a big waste of time for every, everybody and a lot of money spent. So uh, again, it's just some challenges to satellite. Um, I seem to be speaking negatively to all the technologies. Um, of course, satellite, uh, one of the big one of the big pros of satellite is that it's available pretty much everywhere. Um, if it's a satellite truck or a guy with a, you know, a mobile satellite uplink setup, um, any of that kind of stuff kind of be sent uh, essentially around the world and uh, be able to cover a lot of different things um, and get back to your remote head end in a, in a relatively almost guaranteed uh, method of, of getting uh, the video from your origination point to your production studio or your remote head end or, or whatever it is. Um, it, it is available, um, you know, doing stuff over satellite, of course, global coverage is a thing. Um, so that is one of the huge pros of satellite. That people know how to use it. So moving on to fiber and the cost of challenges with that. Um, it's about 20 cents US per megabyte. But the thing is with that, you actually have to make a commitment um, and, you know, from a contract standpoint. Um, to to have that bandwidth. So a 10 gigabit link can cost you $2,000 a month and up, and that's assuming that's all you need. We've worked with projects that were doing, um, you know, uncompressed links. Um, so either whether they're uh, SMPTE 2110 or 2022-6 or 
any of those kinds of formats, um, over 100 gigabit links um, through uh, geodiverse locations. We're talking like hundreds of thousand dollars, you know, a month to be able to move this kind of content around. So that's a lot of return on investment you need to consider when you're building a system like that. Like, am I going to be able to sustain that kind of bandwidth, um, you know, with the content that I'm moving around? Um, the second data point, a lot of people give me a funny look when I say this, um, and, it, and this is true. Uh, dedicated fiber links aren't necessarily 100% reliable. And when I say that is uh, a lot of fiber links are leased lines. It's not necessarily your own fiber line that you physically buried in the ground in conduit and ran from, you know, point A to point B. That's not necessarily what happened. Usually there's uh, fiber infrastructure, um, you know, in really big cities or, or across continents and things like that. Those are owned by someone else and you are usually renting that space. Well, they're not just going to rent it to you. Everybody else is probably going to be on that pipe as well. They're just going to set aside some bandwidth for you on that link in a lot of cases. Well, when you're sharing bandwidth with multiple users. Sometimes there's some things that uh, go a little awry. Um, so you, you can see some drop packets, um, dropped links, um, just general, um, you know, connection issues and things like that. Um, a lot of those things can be repaired by using FEC with those types of connections, um, FEC or, or actually hitless switching. So SMPTE 2022-7, for instance, um, being able to do completely redundant links over um, redundant networks can give you, um, you know, huge, huge reliability improvements. But then, of course, you're also doubling the data that you're using. Um, and that also goes with FEC. FEC can have a 15% to 40% overhead on the video that you're already moving around. So that's additional bandwidth that you have to consider depending on how much, um, you know, how much you're leasing or, or what kind of system you're building out. So, you know, the more data or more money you're spending in that case. Um, and one of the big things, um, you know, how I said with satellite that it's pretty readily available. You can get it just about anywhere or at least access to it. Um, there's not necessarily fiber infrastructure everywhere. That's not necessarily true for every part of the world. Um, you know, obviously, America, Asia, Europe, uh, South America, they, they, they have those kind of fiber interconnects and just huge giant pipes that we can move video through and that's fine, but that's not necessarily gonna get you um, everywhere in the world. And so that, that can be an issue, um, you know, just trying to get coverage everywhere. So we talked uh, talked about the traditional way of uh, you know moving signals around the world. Um, of course, we wanted to move on and start talking about how we're going to do it with internet. But doing it with internet does not come uh, without challenge. So the challenges for internet transport, which I think some of these will be pretty obvious, maybe some of them won't be. Um, but one of the big ones is undefined routes. You really don't necessarily know what path your signal is going to go through through the internet. Um, obviously, there's ways of getting around that, like, uh, you know, VPNs and IP routing and stuff like that. And that that can get you, um, you know, at least a, a partly defined way through the Internet. But uh, sometimes you're just kind of, you know, going to be exposed to the Internet. And the longer you're exposed to the Internet, the, you know, the longer you're susceptible to having uh, corrupted packets, missing packets, um, all of those kinds of things that go around with, uh, you know, Internet data. But then also potentially increased latency. So the more your hops you have through the internet, um, the more you know the more latency you're going to add as that connection goes from point A to point B. Obviously, second data point is probably the biggest one. Uh, going over the internet, you're almost always going to have packet loss or at least some kind of data corruption. Um, this isn't a big deal for web browsers, you know, pulling up web pages and things like that because they can do. Um, all kinds of tricky things with TCP to be able to re-request uh, packets, uh, do packet retransmission and stuff like that. With Well, spoiler alert, that's actually uh, what we'll be talking about here in a little bit when I talk about the technologies about doing uh, video transport over the Internet. But, uh, you know, that stuff is, is easy to do and is expected to be done with uh, TCP with browsers and things like that. But how do we how do we fix that in UDP? How do we fix that with live video? Live video is what it is. If, you know, if you're up and running, you can't afford to lose packets. You know, if you if you have lost video packets, you have lost video frames. And if you have lost video frames, that usually means macro blocking or really bad video quality. Um, so you got to be careful there. 
Um, another piece of that is just connection drops. And I'm not talking about packet loss or data collection here. I'm not talking about full on, uh, full on connection drop. Um, so those are things that we have to uh, consider and, and try to design around so that we don't have any, um, you know, lost, lost data that way. One of the bigger things that people don't consider, um, and this is more and more apparent in SMPTE 2110 networks, but is uh, bursty traffic. Um, so over the internet, um, it'll move through, you know, multiple internet interconnects, uh, different ISPs and things like that. That's going through a lot of different routers and switches. Um, and some of those are handling an incredible amount of traffic. A lot of those are being handled by, you know, software defined networks, software defined networks and, and, and all of these routers and switches and stuff like that can be kind of bursty, especially when they're really loaded up with a lot of data. Um, and so you're not, you don't have a really consistent, even amount of data coming out all the time. It can come out all at once and then you might not have anything for a while. And then again, a huge burst of traffic and then nothing. So in order to be able to handle that burstiness in the data, um, we have to have buffering in order to de-jitter that connection or, or take out the burstiness. Um, you know, live video connections don't really like to have bursty traffic. You don't want all a lot of packets all at once and then have nothing. Like you have to be able to you know, show that video and the audio and, and that transport stream and whatever it is, um, you know, at an, at an even cadence. Um, that's just how video works. But of course, uh, the downside of doing that additional buffering, you're also going to again create increase your latency. Um, you know, and everybody in the in the broadcast industry kind of cringes when they hear the word latency and, and increasing latency. You know, they they shudder that 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 really scares them. But um, I think what we'll find through the presentation is that the added latency when we talk about these kinds of systems isn't that bad, especially when we talk about the uh, the the upside of using the internet for transport. Um, at least when it's done properly, I think uh, can save uh, customers a lot of money and, and has a lot of different uh, advantages. But we'll, we'll be talking about that here in a little bit. Um, so I'm sure some of you have tried this or even have you know customers or systems that, that have done this and it can be done with some success, but in most cases, MPEG over IP with forward error correction or FEC is not enough. Um, so if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, I'll just give you a quick overview just so you have some but uh, you know, MPEG over IP is is really just transport stream packets in in IP packets. Um, and then what we do is we add forward error correction or parity bits. And what I mean by parity bits is is just bits of data that are actually riding alongside this uh, transport stream that have the ability to uh, give enough information to allow packets to be repaired, or if the uh, packets are corrupted or missing completely, we can rebuild them. Uh, repair them and then uh, make a good transport stream on the end. Um, obviously, the problem with adding that FEC is you have the the overhead, and I talked about that a little bit before when we were talking about fiber uh, fiber transport. You're going to get about a 15 to 40 percent, which I know that's a huge range <laughs> of uh, percents, but it really depends on uh, how much how much protection you need, how bad is your signal that you need to be able to compensate for that with more parity information or how much more information do you need to fix? So that range is pretty drastically between 15 to 40%, but even at the lowest percentage at 15%, that's a lot of bandwidth overhead when you think about that, especially when you're considering how much money you're already spending for the bandwidth that you've already um, you know, either leased or, or built out. Um, you know, you, you have to consider just that much more just because you're going to have packet loss or you're going to have issues. And so you have to be able to consider that additional bandwidth. Um, the one thing that I do want to talk about is that FEC is not perfect. And especially when we talk about doing video transport over the Internet. FEC is good at fixing packets that are missing every once in a while. It's very just really sporadic packet loss, so maybe one or two packets here, one or two packets there, um, you know, that's fixable. We can we can fix those missing packets, or I should say rebuild those missing packets or fix those corrupted packets. That's fine. FEC is perfectly okay with that. That's why it works pretty decently with uh, fiber transport. Um, but when we're talking about the internet and how the internet usually drops packets, or has corrupted packets, it's in huge chunks. You, you rarely see it where it's just a couple bits here and there. And in that case, FEC just does not have enough information to fix the stream. 
Um, so the technology is, is a little bit limited. It, 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 it had its time, but in terms of doing transport over the internet, it's, it's straight up just not enough. So we have to start leveraging other technologies in order to uh, enable internet transport. So just wanna give you some insight there, a little bit of overview and some context. And that actually brings us to the start of our second section. So if anybody has any questions, if you wanna unmute, Shoot a question at me on the chat, something like that. It'll give us a maybe 15, 20 seconds here, maybe not even that. All right, cool. So that either means everybody's uh, still working on their morning coffee or are bored. So uh, hopefully you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but we'll uh, go ahead and continue talking about how we can use uh, the internet for video transport. So first, I want to touch on just the general infrastructure, um, not even talking about protocols or, you know, any of that nerdy stuff yet. Um, just the infrastructure, just basic consumer Internet grade connections is widely available, whether it's wired, wireless. Um, it can be, you know, cable, it can be DSL, it could be cellular with uh, 4G and now 5G cellular systems being built out around the world, getting internet just about anywhere in the world is pretty commonplace. And actually you can get it with pretty decent uh, bandwidth and actually pretty high reliability. Um, and the huge thing about this is if there is internet infrastructure there, how quick is that to deploy? You literally get yourself a consumer internet connection or a consumer cellular connection and you have an actual pipe to push data through. Um, and it's with a minimal amount of equipment. We're talking about, you know, using cable and DSL. I'm sure most of you are familiar with getting like a cable modem or, or a DSL modem or something like that. Or some of you might have a cellular based internet at your home that has 4G or 5G connection. Um, and, and that's moving a lot of data. I, I think I have like a, I think I have 120 megabits per second at my house right now um, with about a 10 to 15 megabit upload. Um, and I get that for like 40 bucks US a month. It's it's ridiculous. It's a lot of bandwidth and I should, I could, and I have actually done a lot of testing with Sencore equipment for my home um, all the way back to Sencore. I say all the way back to Sencore. It's like 15 miles from my house, uh, you know, back to Sencore, but still, I can move a lot of, you know, um, from my house to Sencore and, and it's a very good quality video. It's impressive. Um, and I can do that with a lot of the protocols that are available today, just with a consumer internet uh, connection. Um, the one thing that uh, is interesting about this, um, I talked about, you know, the traditional broadcast infrastructure, you know, using satellite or, or, or fiber transport. Um, if you just lift out the satellite piece of it, or you lift out the fiber piece of it and just use internet as your transport mechanism, Generally, you can still utilize all of your existing broadcast equipment or even production equipment, um, you know, whether it's um, cameras, encoders, receiver decoders, multiplexers, I don't know, you name it, any kind of like typical broadcast equipment that you would think of. A lot of those things can still be utilized today with video uh, internet transport as your, uh, your internet using your, for your video transport. Um, all you got to do is be able to put a uh, more of a translator, we'll call it, um, between, uh, you know, those pieces of equipment and the internet in order to, to enable that infrastructure. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be this scary thing where you have to build a, you know, a video transport system from scratch just because you're using the internet. No, that's not the case. You can absolutely retrofit what you have today um, in order to utilize, uh, utilize the internet for these types of things. And the same goes for the remote production workflows. What's interesting is uh, when I mean remote production workflows, um, you know, these are the guys with the backpack cameras and the, you know, the encoders that are hooked up to, you know, cellular or what they do is uh, cellular bonding where they actually have two cellular connections and one's an upload and one's a download or where they both, uh, you know, are, are used simultaneously to, to double the bandwidth, those kinds of things. All of that stuff uses the public internet for the most part. Um, they just leverage some, uh, you know, nice protocols in order to uh, use the internet as, as, as their transport mechanism, which without further ado, now that we've talked about, um, you know, some history, some traditional broadcast methods and giving you some context on challenges for internet transport, 
um, and also the infrastructure, we can finally start talking about the protocols. So I'm pretty sure everybody can look at the right hand side of the screen and probably recognize, I would assume at least two or three of those logos. Um, there are some household names in the industry um, with, that have been doing this actually for quite a few years and built some really impressive systems. But there's also some new kids on the block um, that have really been kind of disrupting the market and causing a lot of the, uh, um, you know, the adoption of internet uh, for video transport, like I was talking about earlier. Like th this isn't necessarily new and, and people have just now started doing it. It's just picking up as a, as a huge wave of change through the industry um, because of guys um, that are that are doing, you know, the open source protocols and uh, the standardized protocols and things like that are really kind of upset, upsetting the apple cart, if you will. Um, and so these technologies are just kind of enabling these, uh, these workflows. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about is, you know, you look at uh, the logos from Zixi and LTN and VideoFlow and uh, the SRT protocol and RIST. Um, everybody kind of looks at those logos and goes, well, there's technologies there that are proprietary or um, specially built to, to work with only those systems. But really, when you break it down to the very low, low level, most of them are pretty much doing the exact same thing. They might have different names. They might accomplish it just slightly differently but the way they actually um, behave and what they're trying to do it is very very similar and i'll talk about that here in the next couple of slides um so really the same principles are shared across all of those systems um you know they're they're trying to make the internet just distribution or that internet uh transport a robust system you know how do we get around all of the issues like latency and pass through the internet and packet loss and uh, connection drops and all those kinds of things. How can we uh, make it robust enough where people can use it as a reliable, uh, reliable network? Um, and really, they achieve that by doing packet retransmission. So I hinted at this a little bit earlier, where I talked about how web browsers use TCP in order to, you know, request that uh, that website data from a web server somewhere out on the internet. The web server then sends it to the web browser. Well, not necessarily all those packets are going to get to the web browser, but the web browser is able to say, hey, I packets or these packets that you sent me are corrupted. Can you please send them to me again? That's exactly what all of these protocols are doing. And that's just packet retransmission. Um, and what is funny about that is in addition to the packet retransmission, there are also some of them are using forward error correction as an optional kind of um we'll say additional support to the packet retransmission. So it's a little, kind of a, uh, a double, uh, double dipping, I guess, for uh, just trying to make sure your connections are reliable. The other piece of that is link bonding. So link bonding is actually taking two separate internet connections and bonding them together or gluing them together. But they work together to move the same bandwidth. So in other words, you could take, uh, you know, two 4G cellular connections or two 5G cellular connections or two cable modems or whatever you want to do and actually either double the bandwidth or give yourself almost a completely redundant network. You can do bandwidth sharing between those two networks. Um, there's a lot of really cool flexibility that you can do um, in order to gain some redundancy and additional bandwidth um, using link bonding uh, with these types of protocols. And the other big concern with sending video over the internet is always security. People are always worried about, um, you know, who's out there trying to get my my data that I'm sending across the internet. You know, can they, you know, hijack my connection and pirate all of my content and post it somewhere on uh, on the internet? Um, well, yes, they can unless you encrypt it and you know adhere to some kind of security guidelines. What's uh, a good thing about every single one of the protocols that are listed on the screen here, in addition to the ones that aren't on the screen, um, they are uh, they all have native encryption support, um, whether it's AES-128, AES-256, uh, DTLS, all kinds of different kinds of encryption systems and algorithms in order to scramble those bits as they make their way across the Internet. Uh, you know, make it virtually impossible for them to be able to capture that data and uh, and crack it, I guess, or or de uh, you know descramble it or decrypt it, and uh, and have it for themselves. So um, there's, it's all built into all of these types of protocols just because of that uh, that concern. Um, 
what you're going to see or what are the differences between all these protocols uh, really comes down between uh, comes down to two things. Um, one of them is the workflows that you see. Um, I will hide, highlight this and talk a little bit more about it later in the presentation. But really, what this comes down to is, um, are these point to point internet connections or point to point workflows, or are these uh, workflows that utilize cloud infrastructures, um, you know, CDNs, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, um, all of those different kinds of platforms um, can vastly change the workflow and, and how the signals traverse the internet. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the other big difference is OPEX versus CAPEX models. What I mean by this is, um, you know, when, when your customers are when you're building a system, you know, we'll, we'll just talk about Zixi as, a, as, a, as an example, kind of a household name in the industry uh, for this particular type of technology um, is a is an OPEX model. They, they want their customers to be, you know, signed up with a contract, um, you know, pay per bandwidth. Um, that's a yearly expense for customers. And so um, they, they definitely uh, operate on, a, on an OPEX model for their product. Um, Protocols like SRT, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, are more of a capex model. Um, what I mean by that is you pretty much spend the money once on the products that you're using, and more or less, you really don't have to spend any more money in royalties or contractual negotiations or anything like that. You just pay for your internet connection as long as you have the equipment that supports SRT. Then you can use SRT over the internet. Um, and RIST is very similar to that. So it really just is kind of how. Um, you know, how the products are, I guess, presented to end customers and, and how they have to pay for them is, is the two, two big differences there. So just wanted to categorize a little bit um, how the protocols fall in the market. Um, there's some proprietary protocols, um, you know, they kind of, they're not very open with how the technologies necessarily work or they're not, you know, open source or standardized or anything like that. Um, but, you know, there's some household names here. I think most of you have probably heard a lot of these, um, like Zixi, LTN, VideoFlow, uh, DVEO has a, pro a protocol called Dozer, um, Avi's, Avi West's SST protocol, um, which has been huge in the uh, cellular, um, you know, remote production or uh, contribution space over cellular. Um, Avi West's SST protocol, pretty splash history over the I'd say a year, year and a half. Um, then we talk about something completely different, which is an open source protocol, which this is a, you know, an open source protocol means that it's posted up on GitHub and anybody that knows how to do coding can actually contribute to the project and fix bugs and propose, um, you know, talk about new uh, feature sets and things like that and, and work on those and, and help the, uh, and help the protocol grow. And uh, so that's kind of a unique thing about SRT. Um, if you don't know, SRT was started by High Vision and Wowza. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many years ago that was now. That was probably three or four years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, those two companies came together and developed this protocol. And then, um, as opposed to you know keeping it to themselves, keeping it to themselves and making it proprietary, what they decided to do is actually make it open source. And a lot of other people. Um, you know, got on that and, and they started the SRT Alliance, which is like, I think it's 100 and, or 200 vendors now, something like that. Something, it's a pretty high number of vendors in the industry that have adopted SRT as a protocol, um, Sencore is included, um, in order to, to enable uh, video transport over the internet. And there's a couple other ones uh, that are standards based. Some of these are old, some of these are very, very new. Um, one of the really new ones, which is RIST, that's been worked on for the past, I would say probably two years now. This is actually a, uh, a new protocol being worked on by the VSF for the video services forums um, to be based around a lot of uh, IEEE, uh, R RFC and SIMPTE standards so that that way once RIST is, um, well, it's actually pretty much released now. Um, this will be the very first protocol that will be based on actual standards that, that people, you know, will have standards documents to actually uh, make products against, which is uh, in the broadcast industry, a very useful thing in terms of backwards compatibility and making sure everybody plays nice with each other. Um, there's some challenges there with, you know, the proprietary protocols where, um, you know, for instance, 
you know, not every everything that supports Sixty may not play nice with everything that that supports Sixty, and the same goes for SRT with open source protocols. Um, if you're running a different version than someone else, maybe those protocols um, don't actually communicate with each other. They don't have very good backwards compatibility. There can be some issues there. Or RIST is uh, specifically designed um, or to be backwards compatible um, with a lot of different technologies and, and equipment. And uh, you know anything that supports RIST should be able to transmit and receive RIST um, between vendors and things like that. The other one is uh, ARQ. Um, this is actually pretty much packet retransmission in a in a standard. Um, a lot of people actually support ARQ natively um, on their equipment. Um, but it doesn't have quite the robustness that some of these proprietary and open source protocols or RIST has. Um, there's a little bit different uh, buffering metrics and stuff like that that go along with these other protocols that allow them to be much more reliable or much more powerful compared to uh, just the basic ARQ, um, ARQ technology. And then, of course, there's uh, SMPTE 2022-1 uh, with uh, with two, that that's actually just I was a fancy way of saying MPEG over IP with FEC. Um, I probably should have said that in with uh, parentheses, but that's like the weird engineer in me. I, I went ahead and actually wrote the SMPTE standard, so sorry about that. But that's uh, of course that's been around since uh, forever, I guess, like fifteen years or something like that. People have been doing MPEG over IP um, on IP networks, uh, you know, via unicast and multicast with, with FEC for for many many years. I think just about everybody in the Industry supports, you know, MPEG over IP with FEC, so that that's nothing new. But it does uh, it does its job in, in certain networks. Um, yeah, but obviously these protocols are much much better at doing uh, transmission over the internet. So I talked a little bit about how all of the products, or not products, the protocols share uh, the same general technology in order to achieve that robustness when going over the internet. And really, it's just a, a giant uh, buffers on both the transmitter and the receiver. And just to kind of describe how that receive buffer works, um, as you can see, kind of on the uh, left hand side of the uh, the graphic, there you have the receive packets coming into your uh, your input buffer, and then you have that kind of first couple packets or first bit of time there. We actually reorder the packets if they've come in out of order, which is something. And then, of course, um, we can detect whether or not packets have been lost. Uh, either it's, uh, you know, sequence counters usually um, are a good way of figuring out whether or not packets are missing or corrupted or something like that. Then everything after that is our reassembly section. This is the part where the receiving device then reaches out to the transmitting device and says, hey, I am missing packets or these packets are corrupt and I cannot fix them. Please retransmit them. So. Between that packet loss detected here and the retransmission assembly section ending, we have that, that little bit of buffer to wait for packets while the, the transmitting device is able to retransmit those packets and, uh, and be able to fix the, uh, fix the stream before it gets uh, to where whatever we're processing, whether that's a receiver decoder um, or some kind of a turnaround device or something like that. That's the, uh, that's the point of no recovery or you can't fix it at that point. To kind of talk about how that packet retransmission happens when the packets are requested by the receiver is what's called burst sending. So in other words, we have a little bit of bandwidth overhead that's actually dedicated temporarily um, to burst send those missing packets. So there you can see the buffer data. Um, this is actually taken from the SRT deployment guide, so I gave them some credit here. But here you have your, your transmitter buffer. So your, your transmitter actually hangs on to packets for quite a while, even after sending them, just to make sure that it has the packets to be able to retransmit to begin with. And then here we have a giant link failure. And when the receiving device starts to recognize that those packets are gone, it requests those again in the transmitter out of its output buffer, bursts sends those missing packets in addition to the normal stream bandwidth, because obviously you have to keep sending the stream out, uh, especially with live video. Um, but those those missing packets or corrupted packets then are burst sent um, across a, a certain amount of time in order to uh, to replace those packets replace those packets at the receiver. So that's the general concept that 
every single one of these protocols, whether it's RIST or SRT or Zixi or LTN or video flow, or I don't know, you name it. They're essentially using um, this burst sending and buffer data approach to retransmit packets uh, to kind of pretend like they're a TCP connection, you know, like the web browser uh, requesting um, a website from a web server. Um, it's kind of acting like that, where it's just, uh, you know, re-requesting that packet in, a packet again in order to get it. Um, and I did talk about a little bit about how sometimes FEC is used in addition to this. So if there's only a couple packets missing, uh, the receiver should be able to automatically fix those without having to re-request um, any packets. But of course, the problem with that is, is that you have to just dedicate that much more bandwidth overhead to the FEC, which can be pretty considerable, um, where depending on your buffer sizes, you can actually burst send over quite a long period of time. And I mean a long period of time, we're talking like, maybe 200 milliseconds or something like that. You, you can't get too large or else it just becomes ridiculous. But um, anywhere from like, you know, 150 to 300 milliseconds gives you a lot of time to be able to retransmit packets uh, that might've been missing in, in large chunks or, or even just a few packets at a time. So that's kind of the general concept of all of these protocols and how they work. Whew. Okay, so that was the end of the second section. We'll be going into our third section. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything like that. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to start talking about now that we. Uh, you know, we kind of went over all of the different protocols and kind of the options that uh, that are out there in the industry. Uh, I think what we want to talk about now is um, how are those workflows different? And I talked a little bit about it earlier, but those point to point versus cloud, which is better? And I actually get this question quite often. People always want to know which one is better, which one is better, which one would you choose? Um, well, there's not necessarily a straightforward question, and that's that's the product manager uh, talking. Um, it, it's not necessarily a straightforward question because sometimes point to point makes way more sense for one customer, but maybe a cloud based infrastructure works way better for another. So it really depends. On what, what does the system need? What is the customer requesting? Um, how quickly do they need to deploy? Uh, do they have a good enough internet connection between point A to point B to even be able to do point to point, or do they have to have a cloud infrastructure? Um, so there's a lot of these things we have to consider when we talk about uh, the different types of workflows that can be done with these types of protocols. So one of the ones I wanted, I'll touch on this one first, and forgive me for using the United States as my map. Um, I, I might have uh, stolen this slide off of another presentation and, and I am from the US, so of course I would use the United States as my map, but um, bear with me, we're, we're moving data across a continent. So I think we can all probably understand that. Um, but the point to point over the internet, um, you know, the, the pros and cons, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it um, from, a, from a pro standpoint, it's simple to deploy. You literally point your transmitting device to your receiving device. Um, you know, it's an IP to IP that point to point uh, thing, and it's, it's pretty easy to, to set up and, and get going as long as you have an internet connection. Um, and one thing uh, I wanna point out, this is really good for regional distribution or collection. So if you're within you know, such a radius um, or, or you're within maybe a, maybe a single ISP supports an entire region of a country, they usually will have the infrastructure and the internet backbone in place be able to move quite a bit of data from point A to point B um, very cleanly. So if you're not traversing multiple ISPs um, or you have a small part of, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a small city or a small town or something like that, you're just trying to get, um, you know, content from one place to another, uh, point to point over the internet it, it is very reliable. We don't really have to think about it too hard. Um, the other piece of it, it's cheap. Um, outside of having your consumer internet connections and the equipment to actually do the, uh, the protocols that you want to use, it's, that's really all you need. Um, there's no additional fees on top of, um, you know, the cloud-based infrastructure or, uh, 
you know, renting time or, or having one of those OPEX models with guys like Zixi or Video Flow or LTN or something like that. Now, some of the cons, um, less robust over long distances. If you're going across continents, across oceans, sometimes point to point has its downfalls. Um, you can get around this a little bit if you're willing to accept some latency. We've actually done some uh, done some tests from our Weijo office at Wellav um, to our Sioux Falls office um, in in South Dakota in the U.S. and then of all the way to uh, Poland um, in, in Europe, and we've been been able to use multiple protocols um, point to point in those cases with some pretty large buffers. And what I mean by pretty large, I mean like 250, 300 millisecond buffers. So from point to point that you're adding about 250 to 300 millisecond latency. Um, but you need that kind of latency in order to do all the packet retransmission. Um, but it was possible. We were removing, um, we were moving quite a bit of bandwidth, I think anywhere from 20 to 30 megabits per second um, across all of those offices, across, I'm very certain that that was across multiple ISPs um, and even multiple oceans, um, you know, from point A to point B to point C. Um, pretty reliably. Of course, we had a couple of packet losses here and there over a 12-hour period, but, um, you know, depending on what your budget is and what kind of content you're moving, maybe that's perfectly acceptable. Um, the other point with, uh, the other problem with point-to-point -point is the undefined route thing I was talking about earlier. Um, if you're traversing multiple ISPs, this can happen over long distances, mind you, or across multiple countries. Or if you're jumping from one, uh, you know, huge internet interconnect or multiple ISPs, you're kind of getting into that undefined route, um, which can, uh, you know, add into your latency, add into uh, network jitter, add into packet loss and data corruption and things like that. Um, and the other piece of this, it might not be possible with some protocols. Um, some of the proprietary protocols, and I shouldn't say it's the protocols themselves, it's the companies that own the protocols don't necessarily want you to do point to point um, because it's a little bit harder for them to get into that OPEX model and get you into uh, contracts for tracking bandwidth and things like that. So sometimes it's either a little bit more difficult or it's just not possible with some of those protocols. Obviously with the standardized and open source ones, that's not a problem, but uh, the proprietary ones, depending on um, what kind of contracts or um, you know metrics and things you have to keep track of, uh, you'd have to, be careful with that. So the other one is uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, huge pros to this, especially when we talk about reliability and latency and monitoring and all kinds of things. Um, it's going to be more robust in all applications, whether it's regional, whether you're going across countries, across you know continents, uh, you know over oceans and all of that stuff. Um, doing a uh, cloud-based infrastructure is, is going to be more robust. The only thing that's really going over the open internet is that first and last mile. And what I mean by that is you have your on-premise um, devices that are, you know, say we have our encoder, our backpack encoder that's doing that live footage, uh, capturing that live footage, encoding it, encapsulating it as RIST or SRT or something like that. And then we're sending it to our cloud-based infrastructure. Now, our cloud-based infrastructure could be AWS. It could be Google Cloud Platform. It could be Microsoft Azure. It could be some other CDN. Uh, you name it. It could be anything. What those types of architectures allow us to do is almost take a shortcut through the internet because those are such dedicated, huge internet pipes across huge internet interconnects that it's almost like a shortcut through the internet. And you're reducing your latency, uh, you're, in, you're, you're increasing your uh, reliability significantly, and you're just shortening that distance where you're doing that open internet into the cloud. So here, you know, I have some uh, cities in California that are going into AWS, and actually the, the cloud icon should be like directly over them because they're in California. But um, just talking towards the point, it's a very short distance that, that that data has to go to get into that infrastructure and then cut across the AWS infrastructure all the way across the United States. And now all of a sudden we're on the East Coast. And then out of the cloud, we do that very last mile um, with, your, with your SRT or your Zixi or your 
um, your risk protocol and you're extremely reliable going in and out of the cloud and you know that your connection is going to be very reliable inside the cloud. So there's a lot of uh, just just tons of advantages there. And then, of course, there's a lot of monitoring applications out there that, you know, some of the proprietary guys um, or, or even Sencor has monitoring equipment that can monitor um, the streams going through the cloud, whether it's ETR 101, 290 metrics or IP metrics, IP jitter, um, all kinds of stuff. You can monitor um, monitor the streams as they traverse those connections, so you can make sure that you have a good 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 healthy video transport. The one big problem that you're going to have, though, is that these can actually get quite expensive. Um, because when you utilize cloud infrastructure, the problem is you're getting paid. Um, or not, you're not getting paid. You have to pay. Um, you have to pay AWS or Google Cloud or or whoever for those bits that go in and out of their infrastructure. So you're paying to to utilize that 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 system, whether that's like I said, it, it doesn't matter who it is, AWS or Zixi or um, anyone. Um, utilizing that cloud infrastructure, um, you will incur a fee, whether that's an OpEx model. Usually, is an OpEx model. Um, or, or you're paying for bandwidth on a monthly or yearly basis, and you have X amount of bits that you can use before you can't use anymore, um, you know, or or your or your pay as you go kind of deal. So that that can rack up pretty quickly depending on how much bandwidth um, you, you need to to move your streams around. So just things to consider. Okay, so actually, I talked quite a bit. Uh, that was a shorter one, but um, this will be one of our last sections. And and here, like I said, I'll talk a little bit about um, Sencor products and kind of what we've done with some of these protocols and and how we can help. But um, I will move. I'll try to move quickly out of that, so it's not so much of a product plug because I want to talk about the unique applications that we've seen, so you guys can get an idea of what the real world applications are out there where people are using the internet uh, for video transport. But before I move on to that, I want to just pause here, just to see if there's any questions in the chat, or if anybody wanted to unmute, make some comments, call me out on any errors or anything like that that you might have seen, or if you just had some insight, maybe you maybe you have some uh, interesting applications you want to talk about, and feel free to chime in too when I'm talking about my applications. If you've had something similar or a, an experience that would you know, help the conversation and the discussion, that would be great. All right, cool. Well, I will move on then. So just talking about Sencor uh, and internet transport. So we actually have quite a few, uh, quite a few products that are able to support um, you know, video transport over the internet, whether these are on-premise products, and what I mean by on-premise, these are, you know, physical hardware devices or pieces of software that can be installed on, uh, you know, mini PCs or, you know, lightweight server hardware or something like that to do your, um, your encapsulation and de-encapsulation of all of the protocols. Um, but we also have uh, some cloud-based uh, cloud products as well that would allow you to get those, uh, you know, your, your video, your video data in and out of cloud infrastructures like AWS, Google Cloud Platform, and things that I talked about before. Um, we have products that can do all of those kinds of things. So I will highlight them a little bit more in detail in the next couple slides. Um, but the products that are really just aimed at being very, very scalable. And so if you have a customer or, or you are a customer that has, you know, maybe just a few channels that you need to get in and out of the uh, internet, um, we, we have things that can uh, go at very, you know, edge devices for, you know, quick field deployment or single channel type boxes. But we also have high density gateways uh, for head ends and remote production. So if you need to aggregate a lot of different streams out of the Internet or need to do encoding or transcoding on top of that, um, we really kind of have the gamut of, of products and solutions in order to be able to um, you know, take care of whatever problem that you have. And then, of course, it's always backed by our ProCare support people as well. So you can always pick up the phone, um, you know, talk to one of our support guys, whether you just have a question about setup or you're having some problems and maybe it's not even our box that's giving you the problem. We're usually pretty good about identifying uh, problems in other people's products, actually. Um, so we're, we're always there and, and we can, you know, help, uh, 
help you work through any kind of problems and things like that. So talking about the media gateways, um, one of the big ones that we've launched, uh, I'd say about a year ago was our DMG 7000. So this is a software based product um, that is really just aimed very specifically about uh, being an internet media gateway um, and a software solution. So we're currently supporting SRT, Zixi, uh, RIST, HLS, and MPEG over IP, receive and transmit. So what we're able to do is actually aggregate or transmit in any of those protocols. And in fact, um, we can even translate between those protocols. So if you have a customer that's using Zixi and you need to receive a stream from Zixi, but maybe you want to use SRT or you want to use RIST in your own network, you can actually turn it around from Zixi to SRT or RIST um, with, with, with the DMG 7000 very, very easily. Um, and this one's actually flexible enough to do both the on-premise and cloud installs. Um, we've had some successful deployments, um, you know, having our edge devices being on little mini PCs and things like that, um, you know, kind of being in the field as the, you know, small single channel boxes at remote, uh, remote locations, and then having a DMG 7000 on a bigger server, or even in the cloud, um, you know, aggregating all of those signals from all the, the little DMG 7000s in the field. Um, and right now we've we've been able to deploy in AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and, and Microsoft Azure. So it's been a interesting bunch of applications that we've gotten into with this product, and has actually helped us evolve some of our other products as well as we've kind of learned how to use SRT and Zixi and RIST and all those different kinds of protocols in order to you know, kind of achieve, uh, you know, transport over the internet. So I would say. Well, how do I want to talk about the DMG 4000? This thing is a Swiss army knife. It's extremely powerful modular chassis. It's, it is hardware based, but because it's hardware based, it has a lot of horsepower. Um, we can do up to 2000 streams, um, 10 gigabit uh, connectivity on each of those IP connections that you see on the front side of that box there. Um, this also has encoding and transcoding modules. So if you need to do, um, this is great for production, actually. I think that's one of the slides I'll have. I'll talk about um, a project that we did some uh, for an e-sporting event. We were doing a lot of uh, high bit rate encoding and then doing redundant paths uh, through AWS. Um, one of them was a dedicated internet pipe. It was just MPEG over IP straight into AWS. But then we also did a redundant uh, Zixi stream into AWS for a backup connection. So that was kind of an interesting deal. And we're able to do, you know, contribution, uh, encode, uh, and in this box as well. So very, very powerful unit, but, um, you know, just as flexible as the DMG 7000 in terms of protocols and things like that. Then moving on to the uh, Syncor receivers and transmitters. Uh, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with Syncor and the receiver decoders. I think that's like a of course, I work for Sencor. I would have to talk about a receiver decoder in one of my presentations. But um, one of the major uh, changes or one of the major shifts that we've made in the last couple of years is actually a new platform called the MRD 7000. That is a uh, software based decoder that runs on COTS hardware, which allows us to adopt a lot of different technologies very, very quickly. Um, and now we've added a multi-channel decode um, in order to get density out of this platform as well. So what we're able to do is, uh, is do multi-channel HEVC, H.264, MPEG-2, all in one box, um, even JPEG-2000, um, up to four channels and one RU. And all of the inputs um, that we're supporting currently are SRT, Zixi, RIST, um, satellite, meaning DVB-S, S, and, uh, or S, S2, and S2X. Uh, ASI and MPEG over IP inputs, so ridiculously flexible in terms of what inputs we can put on it. Decode any codec, and then we have options for uh, SMPTE 2110 and also SDI outputs. Uh, I should have put HDMI on there as well. Um, supports ridiculously high bit rates if you're doing contribution decoding, so 160 megabit decode. Yes, I said 160 megabit decode. Um, HEVC, UHD, HDR. Um, you know, you name it, and this platform can can decode it. And so having those, you know, super flexible inputs like SRT, Zixi, and RIST have allowed us to start doing that multi-channel decode platform um, in those in those type of workflows as well. 
And then one of the new products actually um, coming up here, it's actually not released yet, but uh, probably about middle of April, we'll have this product launched. It's a little throwdown single channel unit that's uh, really aimed at being a really low cost edge device, but also very, very powerful. Um, and really aimed at doing that signal collection uh, at remote sites. So it actually has integrated encode and transcode uh, for MPEG-2 and H.264. But it's interesting because the inputs uh, that we support on this box are MPEG over IP, ASI, SDI, and HDMI. And then we output SRT, Zixi, and RIST. So the real goal or the aim of this product is to send it to a remote location, literally bring in anything that your customer could, could have in their system, whether that's the MPEG over IP, the ASI, SDI, or HDMI. Do an encode or a transcode if it needed to in order to drive down the bit rate to make it, you know, make it more usable over the internet, and then backhaul that all the way back to your head end via SRT, uh, Zixi, or RIST. And, and when I mean low cost, I mean low cost, like probably $2,000 US for a fully loaded platform that would be able to do all of this. So trying to be extremely competitive in the market um, against a lot of the other guys out there. Um, so yeah. And Livian pointed out the SCP hasn't been launched yet. Yes, I know, but uh, it'll be out, should be out next month. So um, we're talking about that, getting that, uh, having some more webinars and a product launch like that um, sometime in April. But I wanted to hint at it here because uh, I think it's a really important platform when we talk about um, internet transport and things like that. All right, so I'm done with the product plugs. Now I wanted to move on to different kinds of applications that we've seen. Now, this was a really interesting one um, where there was a, uh, there's a, well, we'll just call them uh, Eurosport uh, in Europe, uh, where they actually are doing multi-language uh, commentary via the internet. Um, so that channel in any particular sporting event, I think they support something crazy like 17 different languages for any particular sporting event, which I think is one of, I think that's the most language support of any sporting channel uh, in the world. But either way, you can talk, you, you can imagine that having to support up to 17 different languages for, uh, for a sporting event, how many people you have to have on site watching the game live in order to do the commentary and then mix all that in during production and, and all of that. So their idea was, is to actually, um, from the sporting event, obviously do your, you know, capture it from the camera, do the encode, but then using SRT, uh, transmit a, uh, a version of that um, to the home, to the home offices of all of these people that would do all the commentary. So like 17 different people, 17 different locations, they would then uh, receive it with a DMG 7000 and then actually watch it at their house, do the commentary, record the audio live, and then send it back via SRT again to the remote production uh, facility where then all of the languages are mixed and produced live then and then sent directly to their OTT platform or if it's a live sporting event, you know, it, it would be on their channel like on, on TV. So it was a really interesting and hugely cost saving uh, measure that they they went with um, by using uh, transport over the internet because they didn't have to truck in 17 different people to all the different locations all over the world in order to cover sporting events. These guys could sit at their home offices and do multiple sporting events, uh, you know, in a day without having to move around or, or, or uh, you know, build out new infrastructure or anything like that. They're able to essentially use what they had at the stadiums anyway, uh, backhaul all of the stuff across the internet and being able to go to the remote production studio and, and essentially make their content in a um, way more flexible way. Uh, that's a good question. What was the total latency in this application? So what was really interesting is that they actually utilized a low latency encode and decode before packaging it in SRT. And from point to point, even uh, across different continents and things like that, they had a maximum total latency from point to point of about 200 milliseconds, which to them was very, very achievable or very acceptable, I should say, um, especially in terms of the cost savings. Uh, it was huge, especially per event. I think they were saving like hundreds of thousands of dollars per event for travel fees and 
all that crazy stuff. And you can imagine in the, uh, you know, the current world we're living in with uh, the virus and stuff like that, um, people working from home and doing remote commentary or, or remote production and stuff like that tends to uh, make a lot more sense. So um, just an imp interesting application that, uh, you know, obviously has its has its huge cost advantages. But again, you had to take about a 200 millisecond hit. But acceptable for this customer. All right, so the next one. So I say international distribution, like that's a you know huge sexy thing, and I'm not entirely sure it's that sexy, but the way it was done and how cheaply it was done was extremely impressive here. Um, there were six HD channels um, that were going to be sent from Mexico to Germany, um, you know, to be able to you know have uh, you know Central America channels in Europe essentially for expats or people traveling and stuff like that. They had, um, you know, a, a bouquet of channels that they wanted to be able to transmit all over Europe. Well, they were sending these uh, six HD channels from Mexico to Germany um, via SRT, again, um, received it a, a big head end in Germany and then replicated to 300 remote sites across Europe, where then a lot of little um, mini DMG 7000s were receiving the SRT streams, turning it back into MPEG over IP and then those MPEG over IP streams essentially went into your traditional, you know, broadcast infrastructure, whether it was a, you know, a local cable company or or something like that, or terrestrial broadcaster, they were able to ingest those streams extremely inexpensively because they were just using the public internet for their transport. So they essentially bought, you know, the DMG 7000s to go from um, Mexico to Germany, um, which wasn't really all that much bandwidth. Um, but then to go from the uh, central head end location in Germany all the way across Europe to the 300 sites um, was really a capex thing. That's the only thing they really needed to worry about was just buying the DMGs in order to do the SRT packaging um, and the SRT receiving and de-encapsulating and, and getting those uh, streams all the way across Europe. So um, where this would normally have been probably satellite or an extremely expensive fiber infrastructure or I don't know. Some it it would have cost a lot more to do it, but they use public internet for all of this distribution model. So I thought that was uh, pretty interesting, given the fact that it went to three hundred different remote sites across Europe. This is a similar story. Oh, we'll go back. Yeah, there was a question from Anthony: was how many megabits or gigabits required for this application? So. When I talk about going from um, Mexico to Germany, I think it was it wasn't that much. It was maybe your mega per second, but going out of that head end in Germany was like six point five gigs, I think, because it's all unicast, right? Um, and being a unicast infrastructure over the internet, um, we we had to move a lot of uh, a lot of bandwidth. But thankfully, the head end actually. Uh, in Germany had plenty of bandwidth in order to, to support that. I'm sure they probably, uh, there was maybe some contractual renting or helping them pay for some of that bandwidth, but uh, I'm not, I wasn't privy to that information, so I couldn't tell you how much that cost them, but um, definitely the, uh, the pipe out of Germany across uh, to the 300 remote sites was, was huge. But we were able to support that in just a couple DMG 7000s in order to uh, support that many endpoints. All right, this one's pretty similar. Um, it was actually a project in Colombia where they were distributing or uh, doing distribution from a master head end to a bunch of regional sub head ends. So um, they actually had the uh, internet infrastructure to do this uh, point to point to um, from that main head end to each of the sub head ends had their own SRT connection essentially. Um, but it was about five gigabits of SRT content um, sent to each subhead end because they were going like the full channel bouquet was actually sent like the entire cable lineup or their whole channel lineup was sent to each subhead end um, via SRT. Um, so it was about five gigabits here um, going to each of the sub subhead ends. So um, and then, of course, from the subhead ends, it was just traditional cable infrastructure um, direct to the home. But it was interesting just the amount of data that was being moved here as well, just like the one from this one <laughs> going from, you know, the, the head end in Germany to the 300 remote sites in, in Europe. 
the amount of bandwidth that was used there was uh, pretty similar here um, you know, in terms of getting all those things around. So a lot of bandwidth. Oh, DTH uh, is direct to the home. It's just a, it's a acronym. Sorry. It's always the alphabet soup, especially in this industry. Everything's alphabet soup. You always have to have an acronym for everything, but that just means uh, direct to the home. That's all that means. All right. So I, I actually had um, a lot of fun with this one just because of the customer that it was. Um, I actually am, I'm kind of a huge nerd and I like to play video games and things like that. Um, but we were able to uh, support a, a eSports um, live event. Um, it was actually competitive gaming here in the US um, with some on-premise production encode, and then of course, uh, transporting the eSports event uh, through AWS and into multiple OTT platforms and, uh, and then to ESPN for uh, live video coverage. But what we were doing here was uh, taking all the live camera feeds and doing a high quality encode um, they do 1080p 60 for most gaming events. Um, you know, it's really high frame rate because of the video game stuff. Um, H, uh, 1080p, 1080p 60 H.264 streams with uh, multi-language support. I think they were doing 10 to 12 languages on site, which was interesting to me. Um, all the commentators were actually in a booth and doing live uh, live commentary for all the events. It was produced on site. Um, all kinds of crazy stuff. And then they uh, they actually sent it over fiber directly into AWS. They had a direct fiber connection into uh, into AWS. And then they had a backup connection with Zixi and uh, Zixi fed the AWS platform um, for the OTT delivery. This was the DMG. DMG 4000 that did all of the, uh, the encoding, um, the IP encapsulation, uh, the high bit rate stuff, but then also the um, the lower bit rate uh, 60 streams as well for the redundant connection. That was a, that was really cool. The salesman and I actually got to be on site for the uh, eSports event and thankfully everything went perfectly smooth. So we were able to actually just be there and kind of enjoy the event. It was pretty cool. All right, here's a, here's another one for our little throwdown box, the ICP 2100, but uh, local sporting events. So I talked a little bit about, um, you know, quickly deploying equipment um, and, and, and being cost effective and stuff like that. Um, this, this is a perfect application for, for the SCP-2100 where you need to do the encoding, the transcoding and the packaging and the internet delivery. It's more an expensive device and you have to quickly deploy it, um, especially for local sporting events. Sometimes there's not a lot of money behind these, um, especially if it's a, you know, like a lower tier, uh, you know, uni or university game or something like that. Um, and they don't want to send a, like a whole satellite truck or anything like that to the event. Um, like it just won't get that much views, but they still want to have it as content. Um, having like a live camera feed and then backing back calling that over the internet um, to your remote head end is a perfectly viable option with the SCP 2100 and a camera and maybe a cellular connection. So you'd be able to do this with maybe one or two guys, uh, you know, shooting the event, uh, doing all of your encode and transcode, and then send it either SRT, RIST, or Zixi to your remote head end for, for final production and, uh, and getting that into, in, into the rest of your content. So it's just a cheap way of getting unique content um, that, that people usually wouldn't, they either couldn't afford to do it, wouldn't have time to do it. Um, you're able to do it actually very, very cheaply um, anymore using just basic internet connections and, and some and some cost-effective products. All right, we did it. We did it together. We we got through. We got through reliable internet transport. Um, oh, there was a question. Uh, what's providing the bonded cellular? Uh, so here in the states, bonded cellular, um, Verizon is obviously the big one. Um, and to tell you the truth, I'm not sure who that would be in other countries i'm sorry um <laughs> uh, i know how to answer the question in terms of north american companies and like who we can work with um one of the guys i can think of i guess from a european um 
part of that. I think Avi West, I'm not entirely sure who they partner with for the actual bandwidth, but I know as a company, they offer packages that you can essentially, it's like a backpack camera that does a lot of this kind of stuff. And we're working with them, a lot of their products um, in order to get out there. Does DMG 7000 support ISP redundancy feature? Um, yes, actually it does. We do have link bonding. Um, so if you have two different ISPs, um, we'll just pretend one of them is a cable modem and then one of them is cellular just for the sake of conversation. Um, we can actually do link bonding across those two connections. So you can either do, uh, if you want to do hitless switching, or if you want to do bandwidth sharing or, or something like that, we absolutely support link bonding with uh, Zixi and SRT right now. And we will have it with RIST. Um, there's a, a more advanced protocol, or I shouldn't say protocol, sorry. There's a more advanced pro profile for RIST that's coming out here very soon that will allow us to do it with RIST as well. So, yes, we have that. All right. So if that's all the questions, I am actually going to hand it back to Livian for a drawing. I know all of you are probably pretty excited about that, actually. Um, so I think Livian, if you want to take it over. Oh, there was another question. Uh, what is the difference of this setup as compared to the cheaper webcam used by the e-bidding? Um, I guess I'm not sure what you mean by the e-bidding. Could you expand on that a little bit? You can you can unmute by the way. Now you don't have to <laughs> be muted now. <laughs> uh, there was one other question. Um, oh, live bidding. Oh, okay. Um, so there is a, hmm, that almost sounds like a, uh, what do I want to say? Instead of, that's almost like video conferencing versus live video transport. And there is a little bit, there's a difference there in terms of saying like, I don't know, how do I want to compare that? That's almost like Skype or like uh, WeChat or QQ or something like that, where you're doing like, you know, video chatting. Um, that's not really, I don't think that's really meant for, um, like live video transfer for contribution and distribution. So there's a difference between like broadcast and then what we would consider like more of an enterprise model. Um, we're not really in the enterprise business for like doing video conferencing and things like that. But, um, in terms of the, you know, video content, live sporting events or, you know, video distribution to cable operators or, you know, satellite broadcasters, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's the kind of equipment and those are the applications I think we would be more involved in. Yes, the webcam thing would be cheaper, but I'm not entirely sure it would actually accomplish what you're trying to get to with, uh, you know, something like an SCP 2100 or something like that. Um, Diana did ask another question. Um, does SCP 2100 support multiplexing feature after encoding and transcoding? Um, multiplexing might be on the roadmap, but at the point, at this point, the SCP-2100 is actually just a single channel unit. Um, if it is a, for instance, if you already have an already encoded stream, like an ASI stream or an MPEG over IP stream, um, you can encapsulate that and, and send that over. So in that case, you're not really needing to do any multiplexing. But if you're doing an encode or a transcode, um, that would be a single channel application for this box. And so, um, no, we won't support multiplexing on this platform. It's meant to be a single channel platform. And someone asked, uh, how about the Sunday church session? So actually, we've had quite a few applications where um, we've done house of worship type stuff. So um, <laughs> especially in today in a, uh, today's age, um, what we've seen is there will be, um, well, in the U.S. anyway, 
they call them mega churches, um, but they're essentially like really large, centrally located churches with a lot of different, uh, I guess, video, almost broadcast like equipment. Um, what they've been able to do is, um, you know, do their live event or, or, you know, whether it's on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever day, um, they will actually do a live encode um, of that service and then actually send it via Zixi or SRT to all of the other uh, smaller churches in the area and then do a live decode and then put that up on a projector or, uh, you know, for everybody else that's in that church that might not be able to either drive or attend the bigger service. Um, we've actually had some applications like that using the DMG 7000 and uh, the MRD 7000 doing a decode um, for that, um, you know, whether it's HDMI or SDI or, or whatever they're using to uh, display in a particular church. But we've had a combination of our products um, involved in, in a lot of uh, things like that. <laughs> and somebody asked if the DMG 4200 looks like the Appear TV X20. Well, you're not wrong. Um, we are actually a, a technology partner with Appear a TV, and uh, we do uh, partner with them on a lot of different projects. And uh, yes, the DMG 4200 and 4100 from Sencor um, is is an Appear TV product, um, but we obviously do a lot of uh, you know kind of co-engineered projects and stuff like that. So, yep, they are definitely related. Uh, there was a question that uh, can Zixi be used in Africa? And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, I think Zixi has some systems built in Africa right now using their infrastructure. But there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to use any of these protocols if you have internet access. So it's uh, definitely a possibility. <laughs> 